My name is Bill Durham. I'm Bing Professor in Human Biology, in Human Biology and Anthropology at Stanford University. Well, we're really happy you're joining us, especially to talk about a, a very important concept. Now, we've just been learning about lactose intolerance and mm -hmm. about the idea that as all infants, we have the ability as mammals to digest these lactose containing products. And as we get older, our lactase expression diminishes. But in some people, the lactase gene sort of stays on and we continue to make lactase. And so I guess we'll start off by asking why in human evolution would something like this happen? How mm -hmm. could something like this even happen? Well, from a pan-mammalian background where the lactase activity peaks around birth and then tails off quickly into the weaning period and into adulthood, we assume, we know that that's pan-mammalian. Even your house cat is lactose malabsorb malabsorber or lactose intolerant. Um, at least every house cat that's been tested is, even, even though people will give milk to their house cats. Hmm. And um, what we don't know is whether the people have found the threshold or the cats found the threshold to avoid diarrhea and other consequences. What's interesting then is from that background of a peak, some human populations show persistent lactase activity mm -hmm. into adulthood while the majority continue to decline. So it's that m minority of lactose tolerant adults that are really fascinating. Um, it's a wonderful question because here's a case where you have an intraspecific polymorphism. You have the existence and if the ongoing persistence of a genetic difference between human populations with regard to some relatively simple trait and a trait that has to be relatively recent in human history. Sure. There were no sources of milk prior to dairy animals. <laughs> so what we have here is, uh, I mean, other than mother's milk, there were no mammalian sources of milk for human populations before agriculture. So we assume that the pan-mammalian background means that at the dawn of history, uh, human populations were all lactose intolerant, and that there would be, at best, a mutationally low frequency of individuals that varied on that characteristic. And because it was a very low variation and there was no milk available, we would have no way of knowing how much there was or how often it recurred and so on. But what we have then in the meantime is this great invention called agriculture, the domestication of plants and animals at the service of the human food supply. We have every reason to believe that um, the main animals that are used for milk today were originally domesticated for meat. Mm -hmm. They were valued first for meat. And that milk was, as the expression goes, that were part of a secondary products revolution where they realized that you could use more than the meat from these animals, goats, sheep, you know, cattle, and so on. And so they already probably had them in close association with human communities. They were probably already harvesting the meat regularly. They probably had mastered overwintering, water supply, herding activities, and that sort of thing. And then suddenly there's evidence for using the, the milk product of these animals. Um, some of the earliest evidence comes from Sahara rock paintings that are dated to 4500 BP that show, in fact, bringing the calf up near the female, the adult female, and the human being underneath. Nope. Now, we infer that the human being underneath is doing this. What else is the human being <laughs> doing under a cow? <laughs> um, now the question really is, what was the added value of drinking fresh milk? It's complicated on the one hand because you had the meat value of these animals you domesticated, so it seems unlikely that it would be just the protein or food supply, yet that was an important early argument. The question, and, and it's also complicated because um, there are ways to get some food value from milk without drinking it fresh. You can, um, all societies that I know of, have ways of processing fresh milk into low lactose forms. Sour milk is a low lactose form. All the things like yogurt and kefir, drinks that are widely known in some places, and most cheeses, mm -hmm break down the lactose externally using lactobacillus bacteria, using a separation of curds and whey. Lactose is water soluble. It drains off with the whey and the curds are free of lactose. So most cheeses have very low lactose concentration. Um, something like yogurt is full of lactobacillus that's already digesting the sure. lactose for human consumption. So here's the real challenge. In a world where most populations have ways to process milk and to get everything that's in the milk, mm -hmm. why would some populations um, still evolve 
this persistent lactase activity. Sure. Because there are external sources of lactase. Why does it have, why, what was the advantage of producing it internally to the human organism? The leading argument of the day is that um, calcium, that the advantage mm -hmm. of drinking fresh milk is the advantage of an additional calcium supply, especially in areas where there is um, a, a, a calcium deficiency mm -hmm. caused either by inadequate calcium in the diet, well that's not too likely if you're being, drinking milk, Sure. Um, but a vitamin D scarcity. And then people say, well what's the advantage? Milk is obviously rich in calcium, but what's the advantage of having, wh why can't you again just eat the yogurt? Mm -hmm. And why can't you again just eat the milk product, the cheese, which is going to have the calcium in it, except for the water-soluble calcium, uh, which you might lose some of. What's interesting was some research on what's called the lactose effect. If you feed in human infants from birth in a, compare, a controlled comparison, cow's milk mm -hmm. from birth or mother's milk versus soy milk, you see beginning at a matter of a, of a few days, you see a big differential in the amount of bone absorbed calcium. In other words, the calcification of bone mm -hmm. is enhanced you can, this is controlling for the amount of calcium. You take soy milk and you supplement the calcium in it so that it matches the cow's milk. They have the same calcium and the presence of the lactose enhances the absorption of the calcium according to this, these data. Now it's a magnificent curve and it, what it shows is that the ability to drink fresh milk has the advantage of making the calcium that's there an equal proportion in the two milks. It makes it more available to the infants who can absorb, um, who can digest the lactose. So what's particularly interesting about that is it's saying that lactase persistence compensates for the vitamin D deficiency mm -hmm. that's built in to the solar radiation pattern on the surface of our earth. So that milk, like epidermal demelanization, they follow similar curves mm -hmm. and that you get the persistent lactase activity and the Lac lactose tolerance at high latitudes. Right, and so just to sort of reword what you say here to make sure you know we're clear on this, um, in the case for skin pigmentation, as you sort of uh, alluded to, the idea is as human migration moved away from the equator yeah. to, to higher and I guess even, I guess we should also say lower latitudes. Yes. They had less sunlight and so they Well, had you could say higher latitudes north and south. Sure, higher latitudes north and south. Um, they lost pigmentation in the skin because they needed to let more sunlight in for vitamin D. There was selection for the entrance of more sunlight. It wasn't sure. that they recognized Good. the yes. need. <laughs> yes, exactly. The same with milk. Not, it not wasn't controlled. that we were sitting around here, wow, hoping and wishing we could have another source of calcium. What's happening is that those that happened to have this mm -hmm. out reproduced by, you can even test whether it's a 3%, a 2%, a 5%. How much does the difference have to be in the long run in terms of differential survival and reproduction in order for this to work out in the time frame that we have from 4,500 years BP or whatever. And um, I'm one of those who thinks that it's actually a pretty small advantage. Yeah. Pretty small advantage, but persistent generation after generation, no fail. It's there. If you have the lactose mechanism for absorbing calcium and making strong bones, less likely to have rickets, less likely to have Harrison's sulcus, less likely to have um, uh, broken bones in young adulthood mm -hmm. and all those things, you'll have that rigid calcification of bone, which you can see starting right out in infancy with the lactose effect. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you.